thank you so much for being here and celebrating Marble Hill Revived and indeed, and indeed Henrietta Howard, um, who this uh, webinar is all about. Um, thank you for being part of this revival. Marble Hill Revived will see the house being open for five days a week for free. It will see the landscape being invested in. And if you've walked around Marble Hill, you have seen that there's quite a lot that's been done already. But we're just finishing off that sweet walk, planting around that bowling alley and just making sure that everything is looking pristine for when we hope to launch um, in the spring. You'll have also seen that our cafe is offering lots of goodies, including at the moment, lovely mulled wine and mince pies. And of course, uh, that's all part of our revived plan um, so that you know that if you have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or even a mulled wine, you know you're giving back to the charity with every sip. There's also a lots of other events that have been made possible by the £5 million that have been, has been gifted to us by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and also this fantastic resonance project that we'll be talking about today, about Henrietta and her hearing loss. And it is with great delight that I get to in, invite these two fantastic speakers that we've got today to speak about this project and about the legacy of the project and indeed other things that English Heritage are doing. So I am delighted to introduce to you our two fantastic speakers today. The first is Lorna Lease, and she is part of Gobbledygook, which was the fantastic group that helped us create a soundscape that will sit in Henrietta's bedchamber and share about Henrietta and her hearing loss. Um, she herself is a, a musician and works with a number of musicians who she's going to talk a little bit more about. But we are delighted to have her here to talk about the process and to talk about the work that she did with a number of our hearing charities um, it throughout uh, Twickenham and uh, a little bit further afield. I'm also going to introduce you to Maria Petz, who was a volunteer with us, but sadly she's gone and got a fantastic new job with Shout Out Loud, which is the youth programme for English Heritage. And she's going to be talking about her journey and also the work that is being done by English Heritage. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton on to Lorna to tell you a little bit about this project, but a great, great thank you to you both for sharing your expertise with us this evening. So hi everybody, my name is Lorna Rees and I am here as Artistic Director of Gobbledygook Theatre. I run a theatre company called Gobbledygook Theatre. We are based in the southwest, so we're based actually in um, Dorset, um, but we work all over the country, we tour nationally. Um, and my relationship with Marble Hill came because I have a piece of work called Ear Trumpet. But actually Ear Trumpet is a work all about listening. I make a lot of sound installation work and I'm particularly interested in how we hear and how we really listen, particularly how we listen to landscape and how we listen to history and what the act of listening does for us. And that is particularly interesting in a space like Marble Hill House, the incredible park, um, and also in connection with the history of one of well, the resident there, Henrietta Howard. So back in, I think, 2019, we brought this piece called Ear Trumpet. Now, just so you have a bit more information about the work that we make, Ear Trumpet is a piece that I've been touring since 2015. It was inspired by the idea of Bronze Age burial mounds fairly near to where I live. And the fact that they kind of emit sound, local myth has it that um, they emit sound at midday and it's fairies making music in these Bronze Age burial mounds and that we can actually hear this um, sonic eruption event. Um, and what we've done with this work of ear trumpet is we give the audience ear trumpets, various different listening devices, and they walk around um, a, a sonic eruption site and they listen to the history which essentially we've planted underneath the ground of the site. Um, and we have been touring this place. We've been all over, um, we've been to Germany, we've been to South Korea, let alone all of the um, places that we've toured to in the UK. So it's a really lovely piece. And it's a piece all about connecting people with landscape and their own history of the space, maybe their local park. And they're some of the most exciting places that we perform this work. It's where people are 
their every day and then suddenly their world is interrupted by something extraordinary happening and they get to find out maybe um, a history that's unveiled that they hadn't yet known. And the really special thing about being at Marble Hill House and in the parkland was that people came across us and I was able to tell the story about one of my heroes now, um, Henrietta Howard, who was so much more than just being the king's mistress. I'm also really interested in earth science myself and I'm really interested in um, women's histories and the fact that we don't speak or they're not in the canon necessarily, even though these women had extraordinary lives. So that idea of her stories is really interesting to me um, and how we talk about women in history. Um, and um, along this journey, I must make sure that I mention the extraordinary other woman that I worked with on this project, which is um, composer and cellist Laura Reed, who is a beautiful, beautiful artist um, in her own right. And Laura and I worked together really closely on, um, on this piece. Sorry, I'm, I'm sort of skipping forward slightly just because I want to make sure that I really feature the female or the women that I worked with <laughs> in order to make this piece. So inspired from this work, Ear Trumpet, we did some digging and we did some site visits before we came to Marble Hill. And I bought the book, the Tracy Borman book, which some of you watching may well have already um, read. And, um, and we spoke about Henrietta's own ear trumpet and that she was a deaf woman. And that to me is also incredibly interesting too, because not only do we not maybe know enough about women's history or talk enough about women's histories, we also definitely do not feature or, or really think that much about um, disabled people's history. And I, I feel like there are so many interesting and fascinating stories that we can uncover about um, ourselves and about our population that have great resonance. And, and that's why I was so fascinated with Henrietta and being able to share that with people. Lots of us have um, deaf people in our lives um, from the D-deaf community, um, people who have progressive hearing loss and actually to unveil some of these stories, it feels like really important. So you know that you know, you're part of this um, trajectory of really interesting people who had brilliant lives um, doing really cool stuff. Um, and Henrietta is one of those people. So I'm just gonna whiz past that picture of Laura, but I'll come back to Laura and the work we did in a bit. Um, and so Laura and I, well, for every project I work on as a director and as a theatre maker, um, I always put a book together and this is the start of my book here. Um, I have a scrapbook that I go through and I start sort of making images because although I am a sound artist, I'm very image led. So the very first thing we did was actually, we came to, I don't know if you can see some of these pictures, we came to Marble Hill House um, just before it was, it, I think they were starting to pack everything down. Um, so the rooms were bare, but we actually got to go and sit inside and make some music. And it was a really extraordinary thing to do because, we were actually, Laura's sitting there in that photo in the bedroom, in Henrietta's bedchamber, which is where we were thinking about making a sound piece for. Um, and Laura played the cello. She's an absolutely beautiful classical um, cellist and she, she's also worked a lot with folk music. Um, and uh, we played and we sang, I, I sing, and the entire house resonated with sound. And it was like the most extraordinary sounding space that I've really ever been in. Now, that's partly because the rooms are fairly bare. But actually, you could hear from this one side of the house, if you know where Henrietta's um, bedroom was, the bedchamber, it's kind of at one sort of end of the house. If you went to the opposite end, you were still hearing the music that um, Laura was making in that room. So it was sort of resonating all around. Absolutely beautiful. And also in the room, the sort of gallery room as well we were playing in, um, you could hear the music all over. And it, it kind of, it felt like the house came alive. And I know there's been lots of concerts and lots of things that people have seen throughout the history of Marble Hill House and, and experienced. And it does feel like this is a place where parties happened, where music happened, where you could hear that all over the place if you were playing. So that felt like something um, 
important to share. And in lots of the contemporary accounts that I read about, there were certainly parties all the time. She, Henrietta seemed to be somebody that loved entertaining and wanted people to come to her home with all these uh, fabulous literary set that she entertained there. So it certainly felt like music was um, a good thing to have as part of this um, piece that we were making. Um, but we were particularly interested in what kind of sound world Henrietta might have lived in. Now, at the time, this kind of Georgian period, um, the obvious kind of classical composer is somebody like Purcell and, and this sort of beautiful and, and Handel, Handel and, and all this kind of beautiful classical work, which um, Henrietta certainly would have experienced at court. But Twickenham at the time was sort of out in the sticks. We're actually out at this kind of country, uh, country estates that they were kind of um, mixing in. And I was therefore quite interested in what the folk music of the time was. What were the things that might have been sort of the melodies on the air um, at the time? And that is why we did a research phase. And we were really lucky to have access to Cecil Sharp House and the library there. Um, and if you don't know, it's the um, English Folk Dance and Song Society. It's where uh, Cecil Sharp House sort of houses this incredible library of um, a folk memory, I suppose, and folk tunes. And so Laura and I uh, spent um, a couple of days kind of going through different books. We, we got books from the library and then we took them downstairs into one of the rooms and we played songs. And some of that music had probably maybe not been played for a hundred years because we were looking at little snippets of microfiche kind of um, uh, documents from, from a really long time ago. As a director and as an artist, I wasn't looking for exact historical accuracy. It wasn't like I was going to the books and going, what exactly was she listening to? What I was interested in was a flavor of that Georgian society and a flavor of something that she might've come across um, on the air as it were. So we chose um, some songs that had maybe relevance to the Thames, had relevance to maybe Henrietta's life and times, and also maybe a song which had um, kind of a resonance for us now that we might have, we might know still today. Um, when we were composing the piece as well, it, it's worth sort of saying what I felt that our main, um, the founding things that I wanted our work to be about and, and to really um, have a sense of what her sound world might have been. And some of that was how we treated a piece of music that we were creating, a piece of sound art that we were creating. So some of that was kind of looking at different types of deafness, making some uh, sort of educated guesses about how her hearing might have been. And also we're making this sound piece for a hearing audience to give a taste of maybe some of Henrietta's sound world and, and, and what her progressive hearing loss might have been. And we don't really know because the accounts are quite sketchy. Also, we were investigating like the kind of sounds that she might have heard in her bedroom, maybe in her bed chamber or, or not heard. Um, we were also really influenced by some of the modern uh, uh, things of her time. Sorry, there's a picture of her bedroom there. Sorry, if you can't see that particularly clearly, I can post these images later. But also this amazing image um, from of the music party from 1733. And it's actually a picture of Prince Frederick, Princess Anne, Princess Caroline and Princess Amelia. Um, and they were all playing a key instrument of the cello um, and they're sort of George II's children. It was I think it was a really lovely thing to kind of have featured. And the idea of the cello being such a contemporary in instrument for the time, felt I felt very drawn to using the cello in the work. So I've already spoken about why I wanted to use folk music of the time. Some of the thematic choices we made, though, were things like um, the actual choice of songs being Iris on the Bank of Thames, which is a kind of really uh, dramatic and sad song. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a little hint of the um, of the words in that. So it goes, Iris on the Bank of Thames, with a sigh and weeping eyes, said to lovely Selenet, let no one your heart surprise. Men are all made up of lies. So it's a real song about these irises growing on the bank of the Thames and, and, and actually often irises do grow on the bank of the Thames. Um, also irises are purple, often a, um, a flower associated with royalty and a colour associated with royalty. Um, and this song is also about um, 
how men, men are awful in this song. Men are really terrible and they do you wrong. And Henrietta's first husband was a pretty, by all accounts, pretty much an awful person. So it felt like a song that maybe might have resonated with it. it certainly resonated for me with her story. I'll tell you a little bit more about the broadside ballad idea that we, uh, I'll maybe sing you a snatch of the broadside ballads that we uh, found. Um, but also we chose to use a song um, called Lavender's Blue, which I remember from my childhood. That's a song that we kind of had um, when I was growing up that my mum would sing to me. So I kind of felt like using something that was a song that was so was popular back then about a garden, but also she might have heard on the air, but also that, that I know that, that we and um, people might, it might resonate for them just in listening to it, having a snatch of that. I'll talk a little bit more about the performers we chose to work with as well in this work as well. So um, I'm gonna go to the next page because these are our performers. So when you listen to the piece, which I'll play for you in a little bit, um, we chose to work with two kind of really amazing um, performers who are both deaf, who, who are both hearing aid users. Um, and uh, Eloise Garland is an extraordinary artist and um, she's actually a composer herself and um, a musician. She um, features her voice actually more than anything features on the piece that we've made, this piece of sound art. But it felt really important to me to uh, learn from these performers. I'm a hearing person, so I wanted to absolutely make sure that I was working with um, performers who might have more of an insight into different sound worlds to me and um, different ways of hearing. And I certainly learned a lot from the days that we spent working together. Um, and the other performer that I worked with is um, a, a, an actor, brilliant actor and, and street artist actually called Mark Parry. Um, and he has progressive hearing loss. So he also shared a lot about his experience um, being a performer and also how he hears. And that's a conversation that I had with both Eloise and Mark. Um, and they hear really differently in different ways um, and have different types of hearing aids. And all of those things have kind of entered into the texture of the piece that we finally made. Um, I'm gonna share this song with you and I hope you'll permit me to. So I'm looking at my watch because I don't wanna overrun, overrun on time. Um, and you'll hear almost a tiny part of this song um, in this sound piece that I'll play to you. We actually initially we were set out or, or commissioned initially to make a sort of four minute piece, um, but the sort of changing curatorial uh, sense of it um, was that actually only wanted one minute. So we've kind of cut lots of the music content from the work, but it still sort of underpins and this process is underpinned by um, some of the deeper work that we did around hearing loss, Cecil Sharp House and all of the research we did into this piece. So um, I'm just gonna sing you uh, some of these lyrics. So basically, if you don't know, uh, there is this uh, brilliant thing in this time called the Broadside Ballad. Um, and broadside ballads were um, essentially sung um, to uh, you'd kind of get by a sheet. Somebody might sing you the tune and you'd have all the lyrics written down. So you'd kind of learn the tune. You could sing it for yourself. Um, and I felt like it was really a really lovely exercise in part of this process to celebrate Henrietta Howard, because for me, she was such an amazing woman. She was a kind of politician. She was a woman of letters before women were even allowed to vote. She was his girlfriend, uh, King George II's girlfriend, um, but she was also this incredibly fashionable woman, which takes quite a lot of effort. Those of us who aren't fashionable women might, might know. Um, and I felt like she should have a song kind of celebrating her and her life. So um, it feels possible because this is a contemporary tune, this Nancy Dawson tune to Henrietta Howard. So what I've done is made a broadside ballad using the tune of Nancy Dawson up. Uh, I'll try and have a sing for you of it. Her frame was small, her style was great, and many wished to be her mate. The fashion set they all did rate her Henrietta Howard. And if a secret she was told in by a lady very bold, you know the gossip she'd withhold. Diplomat Lady Howard. 
So that verse is all about how Henrietta Howard was called the Swiss. She was seen as very neutral. And part of the idea is that potentially she was quite neutral because she kept everything to herself, but maybe also she didn't hear everything that was going on. But also that might have helped her in some ways to be very diplomatic, to kind of stand back. I think she was a very shrewd reader of body language. And I think she was actually very shrewd in understanding and reading what was going on around her. Um, I'm just going to read you uh, a little bit from the brilliant Tracy Borman book, if you haven't read it. Um, the extent to which Mrs. Howard's deafness lay behind her apparent neutrality and discretion cannot be known for certain. Whatever was the case, these qualities now won her an admirer who has changed the course of her life forever. And um, that was about, uh, I think, Swift. That was about that, that um, admirer. Um, Henrietta even had a surgeon offer to cut her ear off because it was of no use to her anymore. So being deaf in that time was really pretty awful in some ways. She, she suffered with a lot of pain um, due to her hearing loss and in her ears. And I, I, I feel like there was a lot of complicated things around her hearing loss and she felt quite, you know, there was a lot of complicated stuff for her and a great deal of pain, which um, I don't really have too much time to go into here. But in some ways, she kind of rose above things and, and continued um, in a way that kind of story of her dealing with that is quite a story of, um, of brilliance and a woman getting on with stuff and being still this kind of admirable figure. Um, what I want to do is actually play you um, the piece that we made, um, which is just one minute long. Um, it underpins, it's underpinned with these tunes that we uh, found. It's underpinned with some um, hopefully sound treatment, which mimics what we think might have been some of the hearing loss. Often being in crowds can be quite complicated with hearing loss and um, locating yourself. And so we've tried to mimic some of that and, and, and use some of that um, within the compositional elements of this work. Um, so I'm gonna play that for you now. I have a bad head and deaf ears. Two misfortunes I have labored under several years. There's a greater fault now at Marble Hill than at Kensington. When all the world conspires to praise her, the woman's deaf and does not hear, 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 does not hear. Love. Yeah. Yeah. Good boy. Good dog. At Twickenham, the world goes otherwise. I shall now often visit Marble Hill, as my time has become very much my own. So that is the piece that we um, will have installed at the, in the bedchamber in Marble Hill House. And, and the plan is that the, the delivery device to listen to this piece will actually be through a hear trum an ear trumpet because Henrietta has a small, what we think is a tortoiseshell ear trumpet that she used certainly later on in her life in that very bedroom. So it felt like we were trying to have a little bit of her life. The dogs barking, for example, she had um, famously had uh, dogs that she sort of wrote about and were very fond of. But that connection with dogs, for example, feels really um, relevant now because every time I visited Marble Hill House, I have met so many beautiful dogs on that space. And so we wanted to find a way of kind of tying some of the modern and the historic together. So it's a really brief kind of snapshot of the, some of the process that we've been through in making this actually one minute of sound um, and the sheer amount of research and thought that's gone through into it. But if anyone's got any questions um, after Maria spoken, I'd absolutely love to hear from you. I'd love to tell you a bit more. But thank you very much for now. And I'm going to hand over to Maria. So, yeah, I'm just going to talk a bit about um, my own hearing loss. Um, my volunteering at Marble Hill and also my new role at Shout Out Loud, which I'll get into in a bit. 
But yes, yeah, so I have moderate hearing loss in both ears, um, particularly at higher frequencies. So around two years old, um, had lots of hearing tests and hospital appointments when I was younger. Um, so I had measles and then blue ear when I was two, just before my MMR jab. And as a result, has resulted in hearing loss, but there's also hearing loss in my family. So yeah, I turned out it was hearing loss and I needed hearing aids in my left ear to begin with. And I started wearing those at about two and a half years old. And looking back at old family videos, you can tell that I'm not quite hearing right either. At first we thought I was just being cheeky and ignoring my parents, but it was because I wasn't hearing properly. So I had lots of speech therapy throughout primary school because often it's the case your speech can deteriorate with hearing loss. So um, did lots of speech therapy to really make sure um, my speech was good. Um, and eventually I had hearing aids in both ears because my right ear had also had significant hearing loss as well. But yeah, I've become much more confident with having hearing aids and my hearing loss. I think growing up, especially in the early teens, like I was a bit embarrassed of it. And, you know, they're powered by batteries. So if the batteries die, I have to change them in public and taking my hearing aids out and, you know, people seeing them. I was a bit shy about but as growing up. It's really not, nothing to be shy about. And, you know, it's just one of those things. And it hasn't stopped me from doing whatever I want to do in life. So I really love playing rugby and I can't play with them in. And it's such a big team sport and communication is really important. But as a team, been very supportive and referees, they have to be very clear when they talk to me. Um, luckily, there's a lot of hand signals with rugby anyway. And just I really rely on lip reading as well. So it can be frustrating sometimes when you know I can't see what's happening and referee whistles are quite high frequency as well so I'll be running off down the pitch and I don't hear the whistle um so I have to go all the way back but even with hearing loss really make sure I have to do everything in life I want to do and including with that I'm trying to learn sign language at the moment because I am aware that as I grow older my hearing will deteriorate further and it's just something I'm really passionate about learning and I really do believe sign language should be taught in schools, just like you'd learn French or German or Spanish. Um, so that's something I'm currently trying to trying to do. And with that, I volunteered at Marble Hill. In 2019, I started off as an admin assistant. And then as the house and the project became bigger and they were starting to do the house conservation, I got involved with that. You can see I'm like buffing the floors and cleaning some of the collection there. And up. Uh, first I didn't really know much about the history I knew the house was owned by a woman which I thought was amazing um only through talking with the team and with Rachel that I mentioned that I have hearing aids and they mentioned that Henrietta also had a hearing loss which I had never I never really heard about disability history and people in history had disabilities so I thought it was an amazing place and I loved that it's being talked about now and there's going to be this amazing soundscape in the house so yeah and I studied history as well at university and throughout primary school all the way to uni never studied disability history or anything so I think it's really great that this conversation is really happening at Marble Hill and also with conservation personally it was amazing to be able to contribute to restoring this amazing place at Marble Hill and Henrietta's home because Henrietta, Hen Henrietta would have struggled with the same things I struggle with you know trying to lip read people or not quite hearing conversations and being confused and not knowing what people are talking about so I think she really is an inspiring and fascinating historical figure and I've been so lucky to be able to help with Marble Hill. So moving on to Shout Out Loud I have recently joined the team and I'm an admin assistant for them and just a little background on Shout Out Loud their English Heritage National Youth Engagement Programme and it's supported and funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund as part of their Kick the Dust programme. Um, it was launched in autumn 2018 and a big part of Shout Aloud is being completely driven by young people and a platform for young people to explore history and heritage all across England and particularly focusing on stories that have left, been left untold and haven't been talked about. Um, 
it's really about amplifying young voices, placing their ideas at the centre of English heritage. And this is done through young producers. So these are like volunteer roles, ages 16 plus, and they really are involved at the heart of Shout Out Loud, making sure the projects are focusing on what young people want to talk about and areas of history that haven't been talked about. Um, and they really do steer and lead these Shout Out Loud projects. And it's just making sure that the history you're talking about is relevant to them. Um, so this included looking at LGBTQ plus histories um, and stories at different English heritage sites and the impact of climate change at Stonehenge. So yeah, really making sure that everything that is coming from Shout Out Loud is focusing on what young people want to, want to talk about. So currently in relation to Henrietta Howard, we are looking at uh, Disability History Month, which is from the 18th of November to the 18th of December. And one of the themes of Disability History Month this year is hidden impairment. So it ties really well with disabilities that aren't immediately apparent, such as deafness. And Shout Out Loud are doing this through looking at profiles from the Shout Out Loud team, Shout Out Loud team so people who have disabilities, because we really want to make sure that the content we are producing, it's coming from people who do have disabilities. So a place of understanding and a, like a shared experience. So people who are interacting with the content really do know that it's coming from people who do understand. But also it's through profiles called like history makers. So we're talking about figures in history who have who have disabilities and really bring them to the forefront of um, the public. So one of those profiles is going to be the amazing Henrietta Howard um, and just exploring her history because I, there's not a lot online about her hearing loss. So we really want to change this and make sure that she is a figure that is known, especially because of her hearing loss. Um, so do have a look out, there's our Instagram and Twitter on there and our website, so do have a look out for Henrietta's profile. Um, and just personally, Disability History Month is really important because it does raise awareness of disabilities and are visible because um, more than half of the 13.5 million people who do have disability in the UK, they have hidden impairment. So it's really about celebrating these people and celebrating figures in history that aren't talked about and yeah I think Henrietta Howard is a brilliant example of that um it's really valuable and important to be talking about it so yeah do have a look out for all the amazing stuff that Shout Out Loud will be producing. Thank you so much Maria and it really is great to be able to share about Disability History Month but also work with Shout Out Loud and um, and also you uh, who's come from your uh, volunteering with us um, to uh, be part of um, uh, part of the the Shout Out Loud team which is doing such fantastic work. We are really excited to have um, lots of questions so please please do um, ask those. I've got a few that have come in already um, as well as lots of um, lovely uh, support from, from various people saying fantastic talks. So thank you so much to you both. I think one of the things that really resonated, uh, Maria, was about um, how important it, it was to think about those who have hearing impairment or impairments that are not seen and those disabilities. Um, can you tell us more about the young producers and, and why would this was it really important to them? So yeah, we have... Um some amazing young people working at Shout Out Loud. And Disability History Month is something that happens each year, but um, in particular, some of the digital placements really wanted to put um, content about the team members as well. Um, just really making sure, I think, as I said, like that the content is coming from people who have disabilities. So I think sometimes when you put things out there, you read them and you want to know that the person who wrote it and researched it really does understand and has that kind of understanding of what it is to have disability. Um, so I think you know, young people really wanted that kind of content to be put out and for the you know sincerity of it to come across as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great initiative that they wanted to do. 
couldn't agree more. It's really brilliant to be sharing um, uh, and also with young voices being at the forefront. So it, it is a fantastic uh, part of English heritage that I know a number of us feel very, very proud of. Um, and so do do follow them. It's it's well worth finding out what our young, how our young people are interacting with heritage today as part of uh, uh, as part of English heritage. Um, and if you would like to be um, like to um, donate as part of that, please do that. And you can go through um, the Marble Hill Revived um, uh, web page um, to help support that. But we are very grateful for the National Lottery who've helped um, spearhead uh, Shout Out Loud and also for Marble Hill Revived. So a huge thank you to them. Um, I've got a few more questions for Lorna in terms of your um, the soundscape. Um, you worked with some hearing charities locally, and can you tell us a little bit more about how that changed the interpretation of the actual piece? Um, what were their responses to to that which you had created? Yeah, absolutely. So, it, obviously, we've been working in really strange times. So we've had COVID in the middle of things. So. We would have done a lot more um, in-person work, um, uh, which would have been live and with people. But um, for example, like with the Twickenham Hearing Group, we'd hope to be at um, various sessions with people. But unfortunately, it, it, you know, quite a few of those people were also vulnerable and shielding. And we were all kind of scared about mixing too much. So, so some of the initial plans went a little bit off piste. Um, however, we did manage to do things where... Um, I made a video and made something that was uh, sort of a four minute long, four and a half minute long soundscape, um, which had sort of more of the depth behind things and, and, and some more of the sound world that we created um, that we shared with people and got feedback from them. So there was visual content. And also I was asking questions like, well, what 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 parts are you hearing? What parts are you not hearing? It's a really interesting um thing to be making something as a hearing person for um people who are uh, you know might be a hearing audience but how to kind of get the right measure right of um trying to also articulate what um somebody with progressive progressive hearing losses um sound world might have been so which is why it was really important to work with like skylarks who were amazingly helpful we got some lovely feedback from um uh, people there we had some we had a sort of in-person session in the kitchen garden which was wonderful where I got to ask a load of questions from people um and also it was really important to work with artists like Eloise and Mark to just kind of really talk through and just kind of you know it, it, it's um it, it's a process I think a really important process when you're going making a piece of art reflecting many different complicated things to actually kind of piece something together with people and what an honor that people were happy to sort of share their understanding and their actual lived experience because just as we're all um, unique humans no um, person's experience of, of deafness is exactly the same and we all hear in different ways so it felt really important to kind of reflect not just the people you know what we might consider Henrietta's um sound world to be but also the people we're working with reflecting their sound worlds too so it was great to hear from you know what young people might be hearing and and their experiences in life and people it was really interesting I had a great conversation with somebody about yeah they could really hear um, a, a higher pitch dog barking but like lower pitch wasn't working for them and other people were completely reversed so um we talked a lot about crowds with um, people as well. So how it was quite hard to hear in a crowd. And we were almost imagining ourselves in, in Henrietta's world, like how she would be lip reading, how she'd be understanding um, her universe. Would she be often, uh, a, a few people would sort of reflected back to me, maybe sort of would stand at the periphery of rooms. So kind of with your back against the wall, so you could kind of listen to what was going on at, at sort of ahead of you. And you could also see people's faces and what their body language is doing. So we were almost like putting ourselves into Henrietta's um, uh, universe as much as we could. So it was, yeah, a lot of careful and quite deep work and sort of deep, really lovely conversations with people. Um, and I'm so grateful to everybody that gave of their time and and um 
energy and didn't mind me asking really nosy and complicated questions about um, their lived experience too. So it was it was really fantastic to have that. It did feel a real privilege to be part of that, didn't it? In terms of just people being quite generous with um, their their experiences, um, you know, kind of as as Maria has has been tonight. But it just, you know, kind of Henry, nothing held Henrietta back. And I think that's something which is a wonderful take home for for um, for everyone. And actually, as a further to all that work, um, the team are working in, to try and find ways in which we can interpret the house uh, to make sure that it's much more accessible. Uh, we've put a lift into the house so that it's uh, that people can be part of that that uh, um, that story as well. So um, and also doing lots of things like accessible sports days, accessible football tournaments. So um, making sure that uh, Marble Hill is an accessible space for all is part of the key aims um, for this project. A really fantastic conversation which um, it, it has real resonance for me. Um, somebody saying or one of the people we worked with um, about saying oh it's not in spite she was a, you know Henrietta was a key political player in the court for 20 years and that's amazing. And it wasn't in spite of her hearing loss. It was actually maybe because of it. Actually, she was then really, really good at reading people, I think. And that's my my feeling about her. It was this was who she was as a person as well. And that was a really I you know, that was a really good bit of um, conversation that's kept ringing um, for me rings really true. It's all part of her. And, and it was a great thing to celebrate about her, too. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think you know, kind of, we're celebrating her in her entirety, and some of um, the some of the other parts of the residence projects that celebrate different parts of her world, whether that's being, a, a, you know, kind of a, a woman, as you spoke about, you know, kind of uh, um, holding property and and. Uh, creating Marble Hill for us, to that of being a Georgian and uh, being a consumer and uh, what that meant in terms of all, some of the things that she had within the house and the trade routes and um, our enslavement history as part of Marble Hill. So just by sharing about it uh, is really, really important. And it's been really lovely to have these residence projects. Someone's just talked about um, some of the other people within her, her set um, who also had disabilities. So we know Pope had spinal injuries. Jonathan Swift was also partially deaf. Um, it's quite interesting that there's a, you know, kind of a, a whole group of people who, who are part of this fantastic collective uh, that, uh, that have made um, Marble Hill and, of course, Twickenham the kind of a bit of the epicentre of of, uh, uh, of lots of creativity, um, which is such joy. So thank you for sharing sharing about that. Do you, um, Maria or Lorna, did you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I think um, just in terms of gravitating towards people who are similar to you, I think in that that's pretty interesting. I think growing growing up, I was the only person um, in my class who had um, hearing aids and stuff like that. So I think especially with like online and the internet, like you can be able to connect with people who are like you and understand, you know, when I can't see someone's, you know, lips and I can't hear what they're saying. And, you know, I think it's the fact that Henrietta had her own kind of little hubs that she had. Um, I think that's amazing. And yeah, just, I think Twickenham and Marble Hill is just such a, a great place, um, especially with all the accessibility changes and everything to Marble Hill and making sure it's accessible and it can be enjoyed by everyone, I think is, you know, I think Henrietta would be very happy with us, I think, for doing that. So it's really good. I, I agree, um, Maria, completely. Um, I think she, she would be delighted that more people could be inspired by her. Um, and uh, ladies, I've been utterly inspired by you as I have been working with you both. So thank you so much for, um, for sharing so generously um, about yourself and the work that you've been doing to, um, to, to make Marble Hill what it's going to be when we open. Um, and of course, it will be free. So you will be able to come and have, see um, and hear the sounds see some of Maria's amazing conservation work um, at Marble Hill. So we really look forward to welcoming you all um, as part of that and seeing everything that we've been talking about this evening. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Maria. And thank you, Lorna.